Well, hello everybody, it's Neil Foley from the Business Growth Club here again today. Uh, very fortunate this morning to have with us Martin Richards, a qualitative consumer research bod, uh, who I've known for a number of years. So, good morning, Martin. Hi, Neil. How are you doing? Yeah, very well. And you? I am very well, enjoying the sunshine. Yeah, we're sitting outside the Forum in Norwich, uh, enjoying the sunshine, so there'll be a fair bit of background noise. Uh, but what we're hoping to cover over the next 25 to 30 minutes or so is all aspects of qualitative research and how it applies and what it actually is, because I, I guess there'll be a number of listeners who don't necessarily know what it is, and possibly me included. Uh, so if we kick off then, Martin, how would you describe what it is that you do? I think the best way to start is at the end, if you like, with, with what I do when a project is actually finished and I'm in front of a client uh, presenting the findings of the research that I've done and once I've told them the sorts of things that have come out and, and through the project, uh, we will finish with sets of conclusions and recommendations which will always be targeted to help their business improve what they do. Uh, so. It's never nice to know stuff. Mm. Um, we try and ignore the nice to know stuff. It's how can I talk to my customers, my potential customers, so that they understand the proposition that I have and get interested in it and therefore dig into their wallets to go and spend money on it. So the end result is that's what people want is when they when they, they come to you is that they want a, a greater understanding of what people think of their product and service? It depends. Briefs to me range from I've only just thought of this, can we have a cup of coffee and, and a chat? Um, through the back of an envelope, through to twenty five page documents that you have to fill in and, and answer every question, tick every box, etc. Um, if I think about the old-fashioned advertising research briefs, they would be much more concise, but typically, say, would be two or three pages and would include things like, this is the advertising idea, uh, will people understand it, will it resonate with them in terms of something that they recognise in their, in their lives. Um, this is a particular execution of that idea. Does that work? Uh, it, has it sort of communicated the things that we wanted to communicate? Um, tone of voice. Are we speaking in a way to our potential consumers that makes them feel at ease because they recognise it as the way that they expect to be spoken to? All those sorts of things can be within the sort of compass of a project that I, that I do. And you said they were the old style advertising yeah. briefs. Are they still still just as popular now? Everything has got more woolly these days. Has it? Yeah. Um, I think what happened, particularly within the marketing industries during uh, the earlier years of the most recent and deepest recession that I've faced um, as, a, as a business person over the last 20 odd years is that a lot of the middle people were stripped out. Mm -hmm. So, whereas in a client company or even in an advertising agency, etc., you'd have had a good range of, of, of people, it tended to be the top and the bottom that were left. Mm. The top people were often hard to get to. Mm. Um, the bottom people didn't really understand what it was that you could do, etc. Et um, there's an awful lot that goes on in the world of marketing, which I wouldn't really call marketing. Uh, it's just pure promotion or, or sales. Marketing is really about understanding what your market is, who your market is, what you know, all the sorts of things that I've talked about. Um, so there's a great tendency with, and I hope I'm not going to upset anybody who's who's, who's listening to this. Um, but there's a tendency if you are young and put into a role uh, that traditionally would have had somebody just a few years in to report to mm. rather than a, you know, a marketing director you know, 20 years your senior. There's a tendency to do what was done last year. Right. 
So here's the budget, here's what we've got, and of course budgets have been cut and cut and cut o over the years. Um, oh, well, we won't do a thousand leaflets, we'll do 500. Uh, so, but you still do the same thing. And I can understand that, though, yeah. can't you? Because if I was an employee, <clears throat> then the risk is that we do something radical, mm -hmm. something a bit, ex you know, something not been done before, and it doesn't work. In I mean, which case people then say, well, what, what, you know, how the hell did you choose that? Yeah, of course. Um, and that is the underlying um, sort of anti-philosophy, if you like, mm. um, behind the... the, the uh, uh, there was a famous American uh, guy who a long time ago said 50% of my advertising budget is wasted. The problem is I don't know which 50%. Um, and is that what you're trying to solve with the qualitative often, research? Often, because an awful lot of research, and he here I go upsetting people again, now I'm going to upset the quantitative research fraternity. Um, you ask questions, you get answers. They will be thought answers, they will be considered answers, they will be what people think they want to tell you, rather than actually what's going on in their gut. We now know, and, and this is where interestingly um, my industry has moved on a lot in, in recent years. Our, our struggle always is persuading the client <laughs> to understand what we understand particularly about the way that the human brain works and the way that decisions are taken. And if we think about a lot of the things that I would be asked to investigate, um, whether it's a, a bursa in a school and what stationery they buy through to a housewife and which margarine she cho chooses, um, and many of those decisions are taken without reference to what we would think of as cognitive thinking. The gut reaction, really, an instant, um, and quick. instant, or dependent on an emotional response rather than a considered rational response. Um, but isn't that why supermarkets play certain sort of music? And Do you think that works? I've no idea. <laughs> it's really <laughs> they have. I don't know. And, and to be fair, the likes of Tesco will spend an awful lot of of money on research and they know to go to the good people yeah. um, so I certainly wouldn't knock what, what, what Tesco do. Um, I suppose where I'm working these days though is, is not with the Tesco's of this world. I'm working much more with, with more regionally based mm -hmm. organisations etc and it's much harder there breaking in and sort of explaining to people you know you've got this whatever it is quarter of a million pounds budget that you're spending each year. How confident are you that the messages that you are sending out are the ones which are going to have an, an effect in terms of people buying your product? Um, could I can you, find could, that out for you. <laughs> and is that where you, do you end up in competition then with potentially with the marketing department? Because if the marketing bods have said, or the salespeople have said, this is the message that we're doing and delivering. And you, your evidence then says, actually, that's missing the mark. Yeah. Potentially, um, you could be in conflict, couldn't you? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, I could... I, I'm going to tell you a story. Yeah. You know I like stories. Um, and I'm going to try and avoid mentioning who the client is because I don't want to be sued. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this was a... Um, I, you know, I can't even do it. There's no way I can describe who they are um, without, or, or what happened without giving away who they well, are. How do you get? How do you get over the conflict then? Because clearly, you want to retain them as a client, don't you? you don't well, I lost it. I lost this one. Did you? Really? I did. Um, I told them a truth about their marketing and their advertising, and we're talking multi-million pound television advertising year on year. Mm. Um, I told them a truth about that because of what I had heard and understood from, in this case, um, child yep. uh, consumers, um, that meant what they were telling them was just completely misunderstood. Really? And, and they, they didn't, didn't want to hear it. Well, no. Um, Even though they, they didn't want to commissioned know. you to do the work? Well, through an advertising agency, yes. Okay. So let's, let's move on to that bit in terms of Martin. How do you actually do the work? Because I guess we've all been subject to surveys and people bringing up for surveys, and I've had loads of them. And I think, 
over the telephone or whatever, they strike me as a total, complete and utter waste of time because I answer the first three questions honestly and thereafter make them up because I'm mm -hmm. bored. Yeah. Uh, so how do you do your research? Well, and, and sometimes, if I can just go back to that first before yeah. answering the, the, the question more properly, um, sometimes I do telephone yeah. as a methodology. If you think about the way that some organisations, that their customers will be spread all around the yes. country, it doesn't make sense for me yeah. to get in my Mini and, and, and head up the M6. Um, although I do do that as well. Um, but sometimes I will be on the telephone. Well, the most important thing to me is to listen to your answers yes. to those first couple so of questions. So it's not a tick box, is it, on a scale of one to six? So question a, three yeah. will not be what's on my list. It will yeah. be something that you are interested in because you've already hinted at it by your yeah. answers to questions one or two. Yeah. That's that's my skill. Yeah, that's, which that's, makes a lot more yeah. sense. And, and but isn't that the... Sorry to interrupt no, you. No, go there, on. But that's the issue, isn't it? So often surveys are thought about they think they know what they want to try and find out and then they give it to a bod or some bods who've got no knowledge of the business or interest who just go through a tick box exercise and think well I've got 20 surveys to get through yeah do you know it's even really worse care. than that now really yep um, it's only emerged very recently but um, obviously um, with digital technology the great change in my industry has been how many more people are being accessed via internet use rather than face to face or, really? or, or so telephone. So it's a MailChimp survey? All those sorts of things yeah. yes but what has what has in, interrupted that very recently is the use of bots. Oh okay. Yeah. So I know not for surveys. Right. Well, um, I know somebody who uh, this 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 happened in the states uh, very recently. Uh, they'd run a survey. Uh, they got loads of responses. And they'd taken the first hundred to give a sort of top line uh, response to. They'd already done that. Went back to the data and started looking at the open ended questions, and started noticing patterns did a proper sort of interrogation of it um, and found out that there were numbers of responses where the punctuation, spelling, capital u letter usage, etc. was exactly the same. So what was happening was a bot was going in, taking a survey and simply replicating it right. over and over. So they were reporting, I don't know, 76% of people say this. Well, they had no way of knowing no. that that was remotely accurate because a bot had been in there replicating a number of the answers. So you and I and this are is on happening the same, over here now as well. Really? So yeah. you and I are on the same page in terms of I, 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 anything that's process driven like that to my mind is, is a bit of a waste of time. You need somebody who's got the skills to interpret the pauses, the ums and the ahs that people say and then actually to try and drill down. And then is that is that in, in essence what you're doing? Yeah, and, and as I say, listening yeah. to those first things, knowing what my client needs to find out without necessarily having specific questions that I'm constantly going to be referring to. What's more interesting to me is to find out about you, listen to you, and work towards what it is that my client wants. Because you, you know what you're taking part in. Somehow, we'll get there together yep. Yep. and that is far more productive in terms of actually understanding the consumer view of mm -hmm. a particular arena, product, whatever. I should go back and answer your question though, shouldn't mm. I? Because we've, be we, we've, we've, <laughs> <laughs> we've allowed to divert ourselves. So what do I do? Um, I suppose the most common method that would be at my disposal and which most people would have heard of is the focus group. Um, however, no project is ever one focus group, uh, un unless it's a political party wishing to make a, a, a point through it and using research in that, in that way. Um, no particular political party is in <laughs> indicated there. Um, focus groups borrow their clothes, if you like, from psychotherapy. So when psychotherapy was being developed, um, first in the States and then over here during the 50s and, and, and 60s, so qualitative research emerged. In fact, it was called motivational research initially, um, trying to understand people's motivations. So a clinical group would very 
closely resemble a qualitative research group. The same number of people, the same length of time, the same skills required of the person sat at the end of the table in terms of getting people to talk together, mm -hmm. um, to, to feel comfortable, all, all those sorts of things. There's then multiple variations around that. Shortened groups, extended groups, bigger groups, smaller groups, um, repeated groups, all, all sorts of ways of, of playing around with that methodology. And then there's the one-to-one. -one. So similar to what we're doing now, except a role reversal, I would be sat with a microphone yep. somewhere listening to somebody and asking questions, etc. And I do a lot of that, as I hinted earlier, on, on the phone sometimes, more often face-to-face. Um, so travelling around, making appointments, going to see people. One of the reasons, I mean, it, everything that we do, of course, is, is um, controlled by clients' budgets. Um, but it's always a hundred times better to do it face to face if you can. Not just because of watching out for the the, the little you know think giveaways mm. uh, that, that people but also because you see people in their environments and mm -hmm. I learn a lot from looking at the books on somebody's shelf from so you're tending what... to do it in their home or office yes oh, always okay. really always oh, okay. um, that's that's my sort of yeah yeah mo if you like yeah. is you know and I've been in the last number of years all over in, I've, I've done a lot of work in the states as well as over yep. here so I've, I've even driven around um, the east coast of America, knocking on people's doors um, in the blistering heat and, 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 and interviewing families, etc. Do people react differently in the States than they do over here? Um, well, the whole system works differently over there. Does it? Everybody who takes part in that sort of, well, in any sort of research over there is, is enlisted from a panel. Um, so you oh, put yourself on a panel. You get yourself say, on a panel. You you earn you more. Paid? Oh, yeah, you get paid. Oh, okay. oh yeah. I mean, I pay people. Yeah. Um, if I go to somebody's home, for instance, um, we will always offer. Um, it's it's a thank you yes. rather than a payment, um, and so the offer is always made as well to, to for me to give it to a charity and, and yeah. send them the, yeah. the the receipt or whatever if they don't want to take it yeah. personally. And that happens a lot when we do business research, yes. um, because a lot of people feel that they shouldn't take something uh, for, for giving up a half an hour of their business time. Um, that's an interesting one. I was don't in, interrupted mm, you again. In terms no, that's of fine. The number of times, and I maybe I'm a bit, being a bit old and crotchety, but there are a number of times where you would get approached to do a survey, and it, it might be half an hour or 20 minutes or whatever that they want of your time. And if it, there's a bit of me inside resenting it, mm -hmm. thinking, you're getting paid to mm -hmm. do this, and, yeah. and so now I always say to them, are you going to pay me? Mm -hmm. And uh, if they say no, then I won't do it. Yeah. And then uh, maybe I'm getting a bit churlish. But the, the charity bit, but I, th this whole idea that you can take my time when, you know, I, I don't know, there's something that doesn't sit quite right there. When I do a focus group, and obviously people know that they've received mm. um, an, an amount of money mm. to, to say thank you for, 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 for coming along, so that's being done, dusted, signed for in, in their yep. pocket, wallet, handbag, whatever. The first thing that I talk about is that my client will be making decisions based on what they hear from this and other focus groups that I'm doing, or depth interviews. Thus it's important, everybody joins in, yep. everybody's honest with me, yep. they don't say things to please me or to, 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 to upset other people or, or, or whatever. And 9,999 times out of 10,000 that works. People buy into that. They can see that for, for once in a while, even if it's about the colour of a yoghurt pot on a, on a Tesco supermarket, they're going to they're gonna have a say. <laughs> yeah, that's true, they're going to have an input yeah, yeah, into yeah. what that ends up looking like or how it's communicated or whatever. And people do buy into that. And I swear that if we were able to get that across in the first place, yes. most people would just do it for nothing anyway. Yes, you would. It's a different mindset, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Yes, no, I'd never thought of it like that, but that's a good way of describing it. That's why you're good at what you do. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of numbers then, if I'm thinking of doing some research, so some of the advice I give people is when they, they need to research their existing customers. Yeah. 
you don't actually need to do colossal numbers, no, do you? No, absolutely uh, not. Is, is um, there think, a feel for it? Think about the... We, we've talked a lot about the supermarket shelf. Yeah. Think about the luxury biscuit section. Mm. How do you know when you've reached the luxury biscuit section? Normally gets to chocolate, maybe, or chocolate yep. covered, okay, so or there's, a brand name. Right, so you've, you've told me three things there. I'm looking for chocolate. There'll be clues as to that. How will I get a clue for that? I don't know. Probably a picture. Oh, I see. Okay. Yep. Packaging, you mentioned. Yep. Will there be clues in the packaging that I'm in luxury rather yeah, than say down market? Or whatever. So there'll be words. What about colours? Yeah, colours as well. Won't what sort of colours do you think? I would have thought more muted colours rather than yeah. garish. Now, if I'm doing that with yeah. consumers who regularly buy luxury biscuits, yes. it won't be long before they tell me purple and gold. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's because that is a standard coded way of suggesting that really? particular... Yeah, go and have a look tomorrow. No, I will do, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now, how many times do you think I would need to ask that before I was convinced that yeah, that was many, a truism? Yeah. 10? Yeah, 12? I would have thought 10. There you go. Now you've got the feel yeah. of my work in, in, yeah. in that particular arena. So, the important thing always is I'm not just walking up to some random person in the street and saying, what do you think about yeah. this? carefully recruiting yep. people who are the right people to be talking to and as long as you've got them yep. then sufficient of them as I say 10 12 can be yep. enough sometimes it's 16 20 whatever so depending it, so on it makes it more affordable then because not everybody's obviously got big budgets etc yeah yep, absolutely what sort of size companies are you working with then Martin I mean, it really is across the board. Um, I recently worked for uh, an excellent, um, I mentioned educational stationery. Uh, there's, a, there's a company uh, called East Point based out in Lowestoft, so nice and local. Yep. Um, really good company, working in a, a you know interesting arena, providing good product. It was, it, and it was good work, enjoyed that. Um, at the other end of the scale, um, I'm, I've done a number of projects now for uh, a company called Interface, mm -hmm. who almost nobody has ever heard of. They're one of the biggest carpet tile manufacturers in the world, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, some of the people that I've interviewed for them are working with budgets of, of several hundred thousand pounds each time they specify carpet. Wow. Yes huge yeah. um, so that's the other end of that yeah. scale uh, in between oh, yeah. over the years I've done lots of work um, because I've got a specialism in kids and young people I've done a lot of work for Guinness World Records uh, helping them with design issues what the cover how the cover should work to, to, to make sure that it shouts off the shelf uh, internal design issues new product development all that sort of thing so there's lots of stereotype stuff as well, isn't there? I mean, do you? I mean, I don't know how. Do you challenge the stereotypes? And I don't know. There's been a TV program. I watched one of it yesterday about can you uh, make seven-year-olds more unisex in mm. their approach? Yeah. And boys, you know, mums are buying the boys blue stuff, and I'm a terror, and things like that. And yeah. the girls are all in pink and called princesses, mm. and it affects their self-esteem, which is this program was. There. Yeah, yeah. I think. Oh, it's. It's a huge, huge issue, and, and, and interestingly, I did a, um, a focus group just this, this week uh, down in, in Stratford, um, not the nice one in Warwickshire, the, the other one, and uh, a group of mums almost kicked off uh, between two of them who had very opposing views on this. Um, one who felt that you should go as far as you could to, to prevent those stereotypes from, from, yep. from taking root. Uh, and another who just felt that girls, girls and boys were different yep. and that you just simply had to get just on with it and, 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 and allow them to be themselves. I think the truth actually lies somewhere between the okay. two. Um, and to be absolutely honest, we still don't know no. how much is nurture, how much is nature. Um, I can tell you that uh, a, a, a truth which a lot of people don't don't like to hear is that male and female brains are actually made up slightly differently, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of 
the physical things with I won't go into all the technical stuff and in terms of the chemical reactions that, that, that go on as well um, I'm a huge so, you know, having brought up two girls and a, and, and a boy, I'm a huge believer in providing equal opportunity yep. and equal everything. Um, but I think at the same time one has to recognise that there are going to be influences, both internal and external, which will make the genders behave differently. We are different, aren't we? It's, I guess it's, uh, it's about the opportunities, isn't it? That's why, I mean, that's from a personal viewpoint, that's what I suppose incensed me when I saw the BBC results and they, they had to publish there. Mm. You then think, goodness me, how can we be this far off, you know, since the Sex Discrimination Act in 75 or whatever it was, and here we still are, yeah. and you've got, you know, public institutions uh, being sexist and, and racist, and, and you just think that just incensed me, I have mm. to say. Uh, I, yeah, well, uh, power to you for... Yeah. for, 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 for that response. Rather than burning them down, I don't know what to do about it, but, but <laughs> it's probably not a good idea. Uh, so, in terms of, how do people get in touch with you, Martin, if they wanted to take this further and, and talk to you, how would they get in touch with you? Well, I've got a website. Um, What's that one? Do you want to give us So, the... I'm Martin Richards. Uh, my website is martinrichardsresearch.com. So, but Martin uh, with a Y. I am Martin with a Y, yeah. Um, I'd love people to watch my TED talk if, if, yeah, if they I've haven't seen. seen talk, thank with you. With all about teenagers. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a great TED. Talk. Just, just, just search my name on YouTube and it, and it comes up. So, uh, yeah. Um, do you want me to give a, a, a phone number yeah, out over this? Yeah. Okay. Well, my mobile number is o double seven double six double seven eight seven nine three. And we'll put those at the uh, bottom of the podcast in terms of the transcript. And then finally, Martin, because it's been a fascinating, and I know we could talk forever, which would probably bore the pants off everybody apart from you and me. But if you, the question I always ask people with the podcast, if you could go back to being a young man of maybe 18 or 20, I know that was a long, long time ago in your case, Martin. Uh, if you could go back that far, what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now? Crikey. Um, well, don't forget I had two careers, mm. so at that point I wasn't... The, the, the world of research was... was so you were a professional actor? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. For, the, the I, I trained yeah. in London and then was, was an actor for, for a dozen years or so. Um, so all my advice would have been about that. Can I respond to the question, though, by giving you a, a, a real mm. answer? Which is, I would have said... When you, when you make the change into whatever it is that you become um, in your second career, don't ignore all the stuff that went before. Don't assume that that belonged to a different world. Um, we hear a lot these days about transferable skills. Um, it's not just about transferable skills. It's about transferable understanding transferable approach, philosophy, all mm -hmm. those things are you mm -hmm. and you have to take them with you. I spent a lot of try time trying to shake off all those things because I thought, no, I'm becoming a serious business person now. I must stop being the frivolous actor, you know, or whatever. Um, so that would be the advice that I would give myself, but it, it, it's for some time in the future from then. Do you know, we, how long have we talked for? Out, just, uh, just out of interest. Nearly half an hour. Nearly half an hour. Do you know, we never even got onto storytelling. Which is your, which is your big thing, isn't it? Yeah. You, you, everything's, you know, all good stories. It's so, and it's how human beings share their experience with each other, and it's about how they make sense of their own lives through the story that they live, um, and that's something that I'm trying to embed in in my research and, and the way that I work in the future but we haven't got time to talk about that today well, it, well let's, we'll schedule another one and yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. carry on with the storyline because yeah. I think that'd be fascinating absolutely well thank you very much no indeed worries. for your time Martin it's been fascinating as ever as I knew it would be uh, thanks very much for listening everybody the transcript will be uh, available with, together with Martin's uh, contact details and I know he'd be delighted to talk to anybody so thanks very much